All right, we yeah. are back. Uh, I am Vikram Dalal. This is the Indian Military History Podcast. With us, we have Colonel S.K. Dalal, retired from the Indian Army. And we have already had a discussion around one hour about the Pakistani military, Pakistani military history. We've gone from 1947-48, advent of Ayub Khan becoming field marshal, the campaign in 1965, assessment of them. And now we are at 1968. General Yahya Khan has become the commander-in-chief, right? Or the chief of army staff. Which one was it? Chief of Army Staff and President. Yes, yeah, so he's the Chief of Army Staff and President. Uh, with me is Colonel Leska Dalal, also my dad. So welcome, Papa. Welcome again. And Thank we you. are going to... Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's exciting. Uh, so far, the conversation has been quite exciting. It's been a great learning, ex learning experience and a pretty uh, nicely flowing conversation. So let's begin from where we left off. We were at 1968. Yaya Khan is the president and chief of army staff. Now we go yeah. move forward from there. Yeah. Now, at that time, the political turmoil in both the wings, East Pakistan and West Pakistan, had started, and it was not abetting. In West Pakistan, Bhutto was leading the political turmoil because he now wanted power. He was an over ambitious person, per se. He was uh, brought in by Ayub Khan. Now, Ayub Khan gave a few things to Pakistan to close Ayub Khan's chapter. He gave Bhutto for one, an over-ambitious person, a person who would only think of himself and not the country. That was one uh, thing which he gave. One uh, is uh, he gave Bhutto to Pakistan. Another was he gave the what is called as dictatorship, military dictatorship to Pakistan. He brought in military dictatorship and he ensured that the military was now totally into handling and manipulating the political setups. Hmm. When you now, say when you say Ayub Khan gave Bhutto to Pakistan, how how did he do that? Was he a close ally of Bhutto? Ayub Khan was uh, Ayub Khan uh, after about 1960-61. He started creating, you no know, sort of uh, a democratic setup, a controlled democracy. I would say he started bringing in that setup. Wherein he, you know, organized. Uh, he started organizing controlled elections. He also thought of controlled politicians. In one such politician was Bhutto. Bhutto was his child, sort of. You know, political child, I would say. Bhutto used to call Ayub Khan uncle, and uh, Ayub Khan found Bhutto as a person who was who was fit enough to fit the role of a political leader, along while uh, going side by side with the military dictator. He hmm. could uh, he found that he could work under the military dictatorship as a political leader and keep things under control. This controlled democracy from 1960-61 till about 1964-65 had generally not delivered the results which were expected of the controlled democracy that were to come up. So the controlled democracy idea had failed. Now, Ayub Khan had no other ideas. Therefore, he gave up the presidency to Yaya Khan. Yaya Khan continued in the same steps. Yaya Khan was a person of a different make. He had his own pitfalls. The positive quality about him was he genuinely wanted to hold elections and uh, he genuinely wanted to place to put in place a prime minister who had the you know blessings of the people, who had the confidence of the people behind him. So therefore he actually he gradually veered round to the view that uh, free and fair general election was the option to reduce, to bring down this turmoil and to bring in political stability, political and economic stability. Without political stability, there cannot be any economic stability. Hmm. Though he talked to the various political parties, the two main political parties were uh, Pakistan People's Party of uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto and uh, in West Pakistan, 
there was also there was also a, uh, like a party in NWFB, Awami National Party, and other small parties. There was Jamaat Islami also. There were other splinter groups, religious groups also. With these religious groups were by and large had been suppressed by Ayub Khan. Ayub Khan was not uh, a person to tolerate uh, religious extremism or religious conservatism. He was that to that extent a modernized person. So was Yahya Khan. Okay. Now Yahya Khan started talking to the politicians. He then ordered free and fair ordered elections to be held in 1969. These elections were fought. On uh, for mainly by Bhutto on West Pakistan, the main leader Bhutto on West Pakistan and Awami League led by Mujibur Rahman in East Pakistan. Now Mujib put up his uh, the political manifesto which was uh, declared by the Awami League under Mujibur Rahman. He had a six point charter, six point demands, and six point demands. The main demands were that he wanted the. Uh, military affairs, the defense of the country to be under the center, the center to control defense, the center to control currency. And he said that nothing else is to be controlled by the center. Rest should be left to the wings, to the two wings, West Wing and the East Wing. West Wing to uh, manage its own affairs in the rest of the affairs and East Wing to manage its affairs. Like this, is, this is pretty much in line with what their demands or manifesto was during the nine during 1954 where they wanted this was, this was more stringent this was okay this was more stringent and uh, yeah khan allowed the elections to be held under such an election manifesto now it, it is quite uh, awkward to when you look at the election manifesto it is a manifesto which says that uh, which is almost very close to a declaration of independent independence by Bangladesh, by East Pakistan. He allowed these uh, elections to be held under this manifesto itself is quite surprising and quite intriguing. Either he was, uh, you know, taken in by the circumstances or he could not do anything or he was, he said, okay, let the elections be held. We will control the things then later on. He had the inputs from the intelligence agencies. By this time, the ISI inter services intelligence setup had come into being, basically a military setup controlled by the uh, head of the state. Mm -hmm. The ISI had given inputs that let the elections be held. We will control the rest. We will ensure that the uh, West Pakistan is like Bhutto or somebody who so wins in West Pakistan, controls the range of the country. And the Pakistanis can, Pakistanis can be suppressed. We will so, have, will be able to control and manage. They normally use the word manage the politicians. So it seems so, like it wasn't. It, I mean, your initial assessment that he really wanted free and fair elections to be held within Pakistan. Mm -hmm. This seems counterintuitive to to that. It sort of seems in this instance, it's, it seems like he wanted the perception of free and fair elections to go out, yeah. and all knowing. Knowing all this while that the data says or his his intelligence agencies are saying to him that the elections will be managed in such a way that his guy or his uh, whoever he he, uh, he wants would come in power, right? So yeah, uh, elections bit... and plus post election also both sides. Yeah, sorry, okay. continue. continue. No, it, I was just saying that it seems a little counterintuitive that. He really did not want free and fair. He actually, he wanted the power to be, you know, the military had got used to controlling the reins of the country. He wanted the power to remain in the hands of the military. Mm -hmm. While side by side, uh, soothing the, uh, you know, feelings of the common man, that we have held free and fair elections, and this is the result. They expected that the elections will be suitably, uh, suitably managed mm -hmm. to ensure a suitable majority in which which will satisfy the you know basic democratic needs of the people while ensuring that uh, the secessionist secessionist secessionist, uh, secessionist elements or talks are ebbed out that kind of thing i i still do not un understand how like 
when you say the Awami League, they had secessionist or you know secessionist light point of view in their mind in their manifesto. All they were asking for was, I mean, they were still saying that the military will be con will be controlled by the center, the currency will be controlled by the center. They just wanted more states, right? Yes, it's it's a little more aggressive. They just they just wanted they wanted except for the defense and currency, everything else to be controlled by the state. So it was it is very close to independently running affairs, your own affairs. You run your affairs, we will manage our affairs, you manage your affairs. It was simple mm -hmm. as that. Okay. okay. That was within the uh, it was while staying within the overall umbrella of Pakistan. Hmm. You manage uh, your wing affairs, we manage our wing affairs. That kind of a situation the Omi League wanted. Yeah, that is many levels detached from yeah. what it was at that time. So yes, that yeah. could be, that's fair. So okay. with, this was taken up, this was taken as a secessionist kind of an activity by West Pakistanis. They thought, how can you permit them to independently man, manage their own economic affairs, their own financial affairs, their own uh, foreign affairs, etc., etc. So this kind of thing was, but Yaya Khan allowed the elections to be continue to be mm -hmm. to take place under this impression that they will be able to manage later on, whereas they were unable to manage. There were a lot of meetings held between uh, Yaya Khan brought uh, Mujib and Bhutto together mm -hmm. to hold meetings, but they could not reach any result. Okay. Then Yaya Khan, uh, the result of the election was itself. Out of 164 uh, seats in the Eastern Wing, 162 were won by the Awami League, only two were won by the others. The Western Wing had lesser number of seats and uh, Pakistan People's Party won, I think, 88 or so out of that. So by and large, the overwhelmingly, the Western Wing had voted Pakistan People's Party of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto and the Eastern Wing had overwhelmingly voted Awami League led by Mujib Rahman. But okay. overall, the Awami League had a simple majority in the overall uh, working of things. Okay. So logically, the president was bound to invite the leader of the largest party, which had a simple majority by itself, to come and form the government. This was mm -hmm. objected to by Bhutto. He said, we cannot allow the Eastern uh, president, to the prime minister to be from the Eastern Wing. We will not permit that. So the talks were held between Bhutto and he, they wanted that, no, we will control the state. We will not, he, Bhutto was over ambitious and he thought that once the power goes to Mujibur Rahman, he will never be able to come to power. All, all his calculations would go out. So he, he wanted power for himself, whatever be the means. He did not bother on that. So he it was went along with that. So it was more along, more along selfish reasons for remaining in power. It was not uh, about, well, the uh, center the, of also, power. Sorry, it was also to do with the psyche of the West Pakistanis. Who yeah. The psyche of the West Pakistanis said that we cannot permit the uh, an East Pakistani to uh, control the affairs of the state. We cannot permit a party which only has hold within East Pakistan and no hold in West Pakistan to run the affairs of the state. Right. Because Mujibur Rahman had no control, uh, no hold over any, you know, he did not win any seat in West Pakistan, neither did he have any vote, vote, vote bank base in West right. Pakistan. That was the state. Yara Khan tried uh, to bring Bhutto to uh, take Bhutto to Dhaka with him. He refused to go to Dhaka. And that is how the situation precipitated to such an extent that uh, Mujibur Rahman and his party people had to go underground. And on 24th March 1971, the uh, you know, curfew was declared, martial law was declared in East Pakistan. Mm -hmm. That is where the problems uh, now they find up. Okay. So this is Operation Searchlight, where General Yahya Khan goes in and tells his guy who's there in East Pakistan at that time, General Tikka Khan, yeah. to his words were sort them out yeah right so they start operations searchlight and it was very heavy handed millions millions and millions of, of uh, east pakistan folks they lost their lives as a part of this process yeah and it was it was it was pretty bad 
and this is March. Uh, this is this starts in end of March of 1971, but it goes on till December. Yes, till December. Okay, so this is the reason that precipitated finally the 1971 war between India and Pakistan. Yeah. Um. Go ahead. No, the the atrocities that were committed on the East Pakistanis that uh, you know those were you know lakhs of people were taken out and lakhs of people were killed so to say like the East Pakistani said that they lost three million people in this war whereas yeah. West Pakistani said they lost the, the uh, there were thirty thousand people were killed well the figure may not be three million but it would be it would would have been closer to that much okay so it's now, more more closer to it would be in the millions yeah it would be somewhere closer Around to one million or so one, one, million. one two million whatever nobody can specifically say what it was okay. but the entire east pakistani population was up in arms against the uh, west pakistan forces now the president yaya khan he they had that psych was still there that they will be able to suppress the Bengalis and control the situation in East Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But they did not have the right uh, level of forces to be there, to be uh, which could be deployed in East Pakistan. The atrocities ensured that there were a large number of refugees that crossed over to India side. There were 10 million refugees, as per Indian estimates, who crossed over to Indian side. The Indian government exploited the situation to the hilt, as is obvious for any country, any adversary to exploit the situation of this kind. Yeah. These 10 million refugees, refugee camps were established. The Indian government fed these people. And the UN Human Rights Commission, UN Refugee Commission, etc., those people were made to visit these uh, refugee camps. The international world was shown what was happening in, the, in East Pakistan. And Mrs. Gandhi started preparing the international community for what was to come in. Mm -hmm. This is the time when, where the international diplomacy of Mrs. Indira Gandhi was seen by the world in full. Mm -hmm. She prepared, planned things well. She prepared for the uh, for each contingency. She went to each country. She tried to explain her, you know, reasons why. The, the situation is so grim that we can go to war at any time. We don't want war, but the Pakistanis are forcing us. We cannot feed 10 million people like this for ages. And uh, this situation cannot be allowed to continue. A democratic uh, People have a democratic right for whatever they are asking. They should be given, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. so she also went to USA. She had a meeting with Reagan. President Reagan was there. Nixon. Nixon, sorry. Nixon was there. Reagan was later. <laughs> <laughs> Nixon, uh, yeah. Reagan was there. It was uh, Nixon and Kissinger was Kissinger. the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State was Henry Kissinger. But uh, the uh, Pakistanis were totally into the U.S. bloc. Yeah. The Indians saw that the U.S. would not allow India to interfere militarily in this uh, Bangladesh, East Pakistan imbroglio. Therefore, the government of India decided to sign a treaty of mutual friendship and mutual friendship and defense with the USSR on 9th August 1971. As soon as this treaty was signed, of, that was mutual uh, friendship agreement was signed between the two countries, it was clear that uh, it clearly stated that any threat to any one of these two countries, the other country is bound to help to give all kinds of help militarily and otherwise to that country. So India was able to ensure that USA was uh, the US threat to Indian forces when they get into the um, warlike situation would be neutralized to a large extent. Okay. When we come to 1971 war, at that time, the 7th Fleet of the U.S. Armed Forces was in the Bay of Bengal. The 7th Fleet uh, presence there itself gave enough credence to the fact that the USA would militarily intervene in East Pakistan 
to ensure that India was not able to control, not able to take control of East Pakistan. Mm. This credence was, this was the overconfidence that was built into Yahya Khan and his team there. And uh, this is, uh, this also, this uh, particular feeling that USA would involve, get involved militarily mm. was also not, uh, you know, it was not successful as the, the, when the war came in, in December, the USSR brought in its own fleet parallel to the, close to the uh, US 7th fleet and the 7th fleet was, you know, sort of forced to withdraw from there and went away. Yeah. The distance between, sorry, distance no. between West Pakistan and East Pakistan is about 200 miles or so. India, Indian government, as soon as this uh, crisis started, refused to permit all flights of Pakistani planes over Indian territory. So mm. Pakistani planes had to skirt India, go re, uh, refuel at, hello? Yeah, I can hit. Refuel at uh, Sri Lanka, and then go to Bangladesh, which is a very difficult you know, thing by itself. Mm. Indian side also starting, the Indian Navy also got into action mode, and they you know, were uh, they were patrolling the Indian Ocean waters in more forcefully, in more strength. They both sides started preparing for war. Both sides knew that we are going into a war, like wars, war. Pakistanis thought that either USA and China both will literally invo get involved into the fight, into the so battle. China's role in this is quite interesting, right? Because China used to be closer to the Soviet bloc because they were both communist countries. They were both anti-West in there. And this is where China comes in and it joins the Western bloc. They, they have this uh, arrangement, which is interestingly apparently brokered by, by Pakistan. The meeting between the US and China for them to where US comes in and then they, they sort of validate the one China policy and China in 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 return becomes closer to the US and a little far from the USSR and that's where India was in a precarious situation where on one side actually on all the sides we have East Pakistan over here we have China on top and West Pakistan over here all of these are adversaries but China could not come in and intervene because the war took place in December and it snows in the Himalayas at that time and they did not have the capability of sending air, any of their troops uh, through the Himalayas during the winter. So the, the, the timing of when the war took place sort of made sure that China was not a threat to, threat to, the, to the Indian side, right? But, on, but yes, the US 7th Fleet was obviously a threat. And I would, I would imagine that they probably did not want the war to escalate to a world war level where it's now it's the so the soviet union versus the united states for a small territory uh, in east pakistan yeah. i mean pakistan was a part of the western bloc but it was one of the would be considered one of the junior partners so not as important as say europe where they would go in and fight a bigger war for europe compared to pakistan would that be a fair statement yeah it is uh, these are all fair statements uh, it was well known that there were, you know, parlays going on between USA and China through Pakistan. Pakistan was the interlocutor mm -hmm. in these parlays, and Henry Kissinger was, uh, you know, the man who was trying to get China closer to USA and wean it away from USSR. These efforts were on. So, to some extent, China was weaning away from USSR. They had had a clash in 1969. There was a clash between USSR and China at their on their borders also. So these, uh, these situ the reposed relationship that existed between China and USSR in earlier days was no more there. Hmm. There, the yes, China was not strong enough to be able to go independently and uh, you know defy USSR. That was also a fact. So the USSR pressure was also there, as also there was this you know carrot of uh, parlays with the USA. And the third thing was the December factor was there. Now, Indian side, uh, the Indian government, Indira Gandhi, 
it, some people say that wanted the war to start in somewhere around June, July or something, which militarily was not feasible. And the same Manik Shah, the chief of army staff for Indian, of Indian army, went and clearly told the prime minister that uh, the terrain in Bangladesh, in present Bangladesh, then East Pakistan, is riverine. It's it on monsoons. Got, it's uh, in monsoons, the entire area almost gets flooded. It's all marshy land. And uh, we will not be able to make any headway during the monsoon period. And if even if we start in summers, the monsoons will come in after mid-June, July. And uh, thereafter, we would get bogged down into marshy lands. So therefore, the idea of uh, operations uh, during that period was called off. In addition, the Indian Army was not uh, fully equipped, fully geared, uh, equipment-wise, to be able to fight a war of... Uh, that level which they wanted to fight. So all that thing was done. The 9th August, uh, the, uh, 9th August agreement with the USSR was signed. A lot of equipment came in during those months. And India was then militarily prepared from all angles to take the war into East Pakistan at a fast pace. Now, yeah. So the war took place. So the war started on December 3rd, 19, 1971. It ended on December 16th, 1971. The person leading the operations on the Pakistan side was Lieutenant General A.K. Niazi. Tiger. His, his Niazi. nickname was Tiger. Huh? Tiger Niazi. Tiger, yeah. Tiger Niazi. So, yeah. yeah. Now, December 3rd, the official declaration of the war took place on December 3rd because once the airstrikes were launched by the Pakistan side on the Indian air bases on the west on the western front, after that the Prime Minister of India declared a state of war with Pakistan. Yeah. Before that, the state of war was not declared, but it is well known that the first, you know, major action on the eastern border, that is the East Pakistan and India border. Mm -hmm. took place on 23rd November in the Hilly sector. There was a uh, clash between both the armies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the 23rd November onwards, the uh, Indian Army, the Mukti Bahini was already inside, trained by the Indian Army. Mukti Bahini was all over the country, all over Bangladesh. And they were the ones who were the guides for the Indian Army to enter. 23rd November onwards, the Indian Army had started carrying out uh, what we say that limited border actions border uh, border actions to uh, for tactical gains border tactical gains i would say tactically important features along the border they were you know sort of like uh, captured or held or occupied in whatever manner you call it on um, but uh khan was left with no option in the first week of december but to launch a war india did not want to declare a war on their side and uh, 3rd december finally yaya khan uh, launched this air offensive and the war was declared india india's plan was to launch a multi-pronged moves from all the directions from east west north of uh, bangladesh and from the south the sea was there the uh, southern side was blocked by the indian navy effectively blocked the uh, all the sea lane, lanes of communication Chatgaon uh, harbor was blocked bombed and blocked by the uh, indian navy the uh, indian army launched a blitzkrieg kind of an blitzkrieg kind of an operation hmm. they were ordered to bypass any stiff opposition and go and hit dhaka the outskirts of dhaka as soon as feasible the order was very clear that reach Dhaka at the earliest. So there was a race for Dhaka actually, from all the directions, who reaches first. That was the competition that was going in. The Air Force of Pakistan won, were in East Pakistan, that was there very, I think there was a squad or two or something. They were knocked out within the first day. So it was a total air superiority in for the Indian Air Force in the East Pakistan sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Indian Army had a sort of a field day from the, because they did not have to worry about the air, uh, you know, that could strike, that's any strikes that could come from the air. From the Pakistani side, uh, Tiger Niazi, as you're talking about, he 
had uh, he was in a predicament he had uh, very few resources either he could hold on to the borders but if he deployed the forces along the borders he did not have enough forces to be able to you know uh, to be able to hold on to major communication centers dhaka mm -hmm. silhet and jasor etc so he was you know he sort of uh, based his defenses on uh, a mixed kind of a pattern some areas he held uh, the pakistanis decided to hold strongly along the border some forces were uh, put in the uh, to hold the cantonments and uh, there were very few forces to hold dhaka the logic they said was that the once the war starts the forces that are spread out will soon will keep withdrawing and close in on to dhaka and dhaka will then be the last battle which will need to be fought if the indian army is able to reach dhaka so that was the state of affairs the indian army decided not to you know keep fighting at uh, where there was stiff resistance they bypassed all resistance that came by them and they target was to reach dhaka as soon as possible which they achieved at a very fast pace yeah how would you assess general ak niazi's uh, performance du during this campaign because it you know as you said he was in a pretty hopeless situation right he was outnumbered uh, he was cut off because from uh, because uh, the only way that he could be reinforced was through by was through the Indian Ocean or the Bay of Bengal or by air, and both those avenues had been blocked by the Indian side. So he was outgunned because of the lack of resources. At some point in time, he would be outgunned if not at the beginning of the war. The, his air force had been knocked out in the in the first few days, that you, as you said. So the only uh, the only avenue in, in his mind that I would see is that the positioning of his troops, he could optimize that and maybe stall the eventual uh, taking of Dhaka by a couple more weeks. So in your assessment, losing Dhaka within 13 days, was that was that going to happen or was that bad performance by A.K. Niazi or did he have no no other option? My my point is that it was going to fall yeah. uh, eventually, but the timing of it, it, 13 days seems like very quickly the, everything just fell apart. Any military commander who is fighting a battle like that, he has his orders from the top. The orders from the top were very clear. Hold maximum territory. Okay, so when the order is to hold maximum territory, he had to hold territory as far as possible at the uh, at the borders. If not at the borders, close to the borders, where tactically they were able to fight. No, that was one thing. If second thing was that he was convinced the uh, he was convinced by the higher authorities by Yaya Khan that uh, the US would militarily intervene very soon and China will also militarily intervene and India will not be able to reach more than a few kilometers from the border so therefore you hold on to borders that was the second issue which uh, this uh, particular uh, you know thing uh, this particular idea did not work out that the Americans would intervene that was new that they should have known from the day that uh, India and USSR signed the agreement that uh, USA would not be able to militarily intervene. And so was also China, for China also does not visibly militarily intervene. Okay. The, you know, there is, uh, uh, whenever uh, the strategic thinkers, when they work out the contingencies, strategic thinkers cannot go by wishful thinking. Right. The West Pakistani wishful thinking was at a very higher, very high level. This wishful thinking is the one which did them in. They did not, if they had catered for, they had thought of all the contingencies, all the possibilities. They would have realized that it is quite difficult for USA to intervene when USSR is 
you know, committed to militarily involved in any war with in, uh, that India fights. Mm -hmm. Now that was the situation. Ek Niazi was stuck with the order that he had to hold the borders. And he also wanted Dhaka to be defended strongly so that Dhaka does not fall. So they want they want everything with the limited, limited amount of resources. So even even in terms of tactics, also he had orders from the top that this are these are the tactics you have to use. It's not he had, did not have the authority or you know the that he could use his own tactics also. No, he could have used one, you know, the command on the ground is the best to take decisions. But then the overall operation order which was given to him had also to be looked into. To, to that extent, uh, Yaya Khan is the main person who takes responsibility. Ek Niyazi is to take responsibility for, you know, other. You know, Ek Niyazi had to take responsibility for his own failures. Mm. He was not able to ensure that the fight was executed in the manner in the, to in counter the Indian Blitzkrieg. He was not able to ensure that. His plan to for the defenders to fall back to the next defense line did not work out. The defenders were not able to fall to the next defense line because the Indian forces bypassed these people and they put roadblocks on the way. So when these roadblocks were put, the defense defenders were not able to come back. So therefore, the next stage was next line of defense was also not possible to be made. And Dhaka was almost defenseless. The Indian side also played a great psychological warfare mm -hmm. activity. They showered leaflets on the Pakistani army Cantonments, army, etc., etc., which lowered the morale of the Pakistani army to a great extent. And Pakistani army men who were there, they fought well. It is they did not. It is not that they did not fight well. The, wherever they fought, they fought well. But uh, they were not able to fight in most of the places because they were just bypassed. They were just left to stay there till the time Dhaka surrenders. It's that interesting. It's interesting that they followed the Blitzkrieg campaign on the east side, where they, you know, from multiple fronts, they get to get to Dhaka as close as soon as possible. But but on the western front, they went. They took that opposite approach of we'll we'll go post by post. Where what comes into mind is the Battle of Shakagar, where they put in a lot of efforts. Uh, and fought very fought very bravely but by the end of the 13th day they were only i think uh, 10 or 20 kilometers in which is pretty close to the border really? why such different strategies on the when you fronts? look at when you look at the forces the indian forces in that fought in bangladesh had a superiority of about 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 15 against pakistan Pakistani forces were somewhere around, say, military was somewhere around 40,000 or somewhere around that figure, 40, 50,000 maximum. The Pakistanis claimed that uh, yesterday I was listening to Lieutenant General Amjad Shweb. He said there were 32 Pakistani military men who were actually defending East Pakistan in 1971. 32,000. Yeah. Bajwa, Jan Bajwa, in one of his speeches, said there were only 36,000 service uh, personnel who surrendered to the Indian Army in in East Pakistan. Now, that was the figure which they had. They did not have much of paraphernalia also. The Air Force was not there. The tanks were, they did not have any armor there, hardly any armor. They did not uh, have the wherewithal to fight that to that level, whereas the Indian Army had put in a far greater superiority in terms of numbers. 1 is to 10, 1 is to 15 is a very large superiority. When you look at West Pakistan, it was almost at par. Mm -hmm. So you have to, whenever a battle is fought, you want to create a local superiority of numbers. And one the is to other, three, one is to five. The and other aspect were, on the other aspect on this is on the east side. They also had the had the support of the Mukti Vaini, the local yeah, Bengalis. The about two lakh Mukti Vaini people were there, and the local uh, population was also there. All these things were against working against the Pakistan army. <clears throat> yeah, and I think the the, the, the strategy the also order, of the strategy of India was very clear. Yeah. They take Bangladesh, 
in the west side hold and whatever tactically you can occupy occupy hold the west offensive and, in the east that was yeah the... and make whatever gains you can gain at the local levels mm -hmm. but uh, it was not uh, to go much beyond because when you start decimating west pakistan when you if the decision was taken to decimate west pakistan also then usc would have got involved militarily in any case that us would never have permitted hmm. the strategically the diplomatically also the uh, aim of india was to create this new country of bangladesh the bangladesh government in exile had been established in calcutta in 90 in uh, march 71 itself and that government had declared uh, independence Hmm. And this government was recognized by India on 6th of December, three days after the war. Right. India's India's aim. That is what I am saying. That the war aims of India were very clear. Hmm. Take East Pakistan as far as as far as possible. Till that time, ensure that USA is not able to militarily inter intervene. China is not able to militarily intervene, and contain the Pakistani forces in the west. Yeah. So that's so, the that's the interesting point on this. Is it's not. It was they they could not have all out war no. on both the fronts they had to contain the conflict in such a way that within the parameters that had been initially defined so that part was very they had to uh, conduct the war in they, a very they had to manner. they had to ensure that bangladesh became independent without any international inter uh, involvement without any international interference or without any international military getting involved into the fight Hmm. They had to do this as a clean affair, nice. and this was, I feel, is the best option to, you know, militarily to launch small tactical offensives in each sector, which were launched, hmm. capture as much area as possible. To uh, which were, you know, when you sit down at the on the talks table, these are the tactical, these are the areas, gains and losses which are to be traded or traded off during hmm. the talks. So for that, to that extent, the tactical offenses offensives were there but not uh, uh, you know as those major offensives to decimate a country firstly okay. the capability of the indian army did not exist because almost they were almost at par on with west pakistan in west right. pakistan there was not much of difference okay and secondly the war aim was very clear it was not to do this okay. how would you rate ak ak niazi's performance general tikka khan who <laughs> Who initially created this this whole halabalu, uh, Yaya Khan and Bhutto? How would you how would you assess them and their yeah, role? There were three. Area? There were there are you no. Know, A K Niazi was the person on the ground, so therefore he had to take the blame, and yeah. he was the person who whose shoulder from whose shoulder every gun was fired at the end of it. He was the one who took all the blame for creation of Bangladesh. But he happened to be there on the ground at the time of when the surrender took place. Yeah, because a actually A K Niazi, as as opposed to the other generals uh, the, who became chief of army staff, apparently A K Niazi was a very decorated soldier during the world during the Second World War. He had uh, that's that's what I read about him. He Tikka Khan, Tikka Khan was the butcher was called the butcher of Bengalis. Yes, the butcher of East Pakistan. Tikka Khan had that, uh, you know, name going with him as butcher of East Pakistan, not A K Niazi. A K Niazi was not in that. Oh no, I was not saying that he was the butcher of of Bengalis. I was I was saying that A K Niazi, in his in his previous tenures, in his uh, role during the yeah. Second World War, was a very decorated so soldier. He was not like as opposed to Ayub Khan or others. He, when you when you look at A K Niazi's predicament at the end of it, he realized that uh, he could have continued to fight. He could have told no surrender. You continue to fight to the last man, last strong, which is the normal order of the armed forces in the subcontinent. Or he could have surrendered and saved it, saved these many people, these many lives of uh, West Pakistanis. And uh, in any case, it was known that India will now win this war, and Bangladesh would be created. That was a foregone conclusion. He could see that uh, that light uh, was visible to him. So he had to take the decision to continue with the fight war or to decide on ceasefire. And 
they decided on ceasefire to lay down arms, whereas Yahya Khan was still telling him, you carry on, carry on. But then finally, Yahya Khan also agreed to the ceasefire. The, and the war came to an end on 16th of December. Okay. okay. So, a Aiken, Aiken Yazi, hopeless situation, he did the best he could for his soldiers. Yeah, his soldiers also his fought well. I mean, uh, yeah. Like, you know, as a soldier, I would say that, yes, the Pakistan army fought uh, reasonably well, fought well. They did not surrender just like that. They fought well. When they were ordered to surrender, they surrendered peacefully. Yeah. That orders for surrender came from the top. Okay. And then General Yahya Khan, he, even after this, he, he was not back ready to, <laughs> yeah he, he, he was not to give up his post. he was not ready to give up his post as president and chief army staff he was forcibly brought down from the chair he was dragged by the collar by a brigadier and uh, he was then told to quietly go home and uh, Bhutto was told to take over as prime minister so this seems like one of those instances in the history of pakistan military and pakistan politics where you, you would think that Pakistan military as an institution would be at its weakest, right? And the Pakistani yeah. political class, it would be this, this is this would be their opportunity to sort of come in, Explore come them. into power and then you know sort of create political institutions, democratic yes. institutions and strengthen them and then start, get you know the opportunity that they lost with the with the passing of Liaquat Ali. They had a second opportunity over here where they could have started that uh, journey, but yeah. they 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 lost out on that also. How? Zulfikar Ali Bhutto took over power after the 1971 debacle, and uh, he became the prime minister. No, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto was an overambitious person. He wanted all power to himself. He, has, he had his feelings. He was a Democrat, sort of, you know, his Pakistan People's Party was the most popular party. He had, uh, you know, popular will behind him. People were behind him in West Pakistan. There was no doubt on that. People followed him. In 1972, he appointed Tika Khan as the chief of army staff okay. in 1972. Okay. And yeah, Tika that... Khan was was yeah. not a very he was not a, again a very forceful person he was a pliable person so Bhutto was very happy with keeping uh, Tika Khan in place now yeah. Bhutto saw this opportunity of creating of uh, creating overall you know political that the political will should prevail in the country create of creating this image or this uh, this particular you know he could have done this and he could have put institutions in place he could have ensured that the democratic institutions the democrat the parties various parties they are able to feel free to you know go in for elections etc etc 1973 i think he ordered he ordered elections 1973 or so and he won them handsomely he could have won won them otherwise also but he you know sort of uh, he rigged the elections, I would say that way. He did not need to rig the elections. Mm -hmm. He was already winning. When rigging of elections was not liked by the people, they said that you are already winning, you are going to get a majority. So what was the problem? Why did well, he rig the elections? Thinking from his point of view, I mean, in the 1969 election also, they probably thought that they were going to win. He probably did not want to take any chance this time after the last, you know, where they had bad data or whatever and then lost the elections at that time, they probably didn't want to take any chances. He wanted, he actually wanted all power. He wanted two-thirds majority. He wanted total majority so that he could, you know, his will could prevail and uh, so that there was no opposition. Okay. Now, after 1973 or so, the Baltistan problem erupted. He launched air strikes onto his own people in Baltistan. There were about more than 10,000 people were killed there. That what, is also, the, what is the Baluchistan problem? Balochistan is a state uh, which did not join Pakistan in the beginning, technically. Mm -hmm. Okay. The uh, Balochistan Khan of Baluch uh, Khan of you know that uh, I'm forgetting the name Kalat or someplace. The agreement with him was signed later to join 1948. 
and uh, he was told that he can have his way or you know his people can have their way the way they want to they had uh, you know they uh, baluchis baluch were not satisfied with uh, the treatment they which they got in an in independent pakistan 1958 they there was an uprising in baluchistan for their own rights that they wanted that baluchistan the way it had joined it was it should have remained that way it should not be you know other people from other states should not be coming and staying there etc mm -hmm. that 1958 uh, uprising was uh, suppressed 1973 again this uprising started and this uprising was suppressed in a very violent manner where aircraft were also bombing air bombing by aircraft was also used about more than 10000 people were killed in that that was also not liked by the people of pakistan it was a dictatorial attitude of zulfikar ali bhutto seem like they just went over this same problem the this, the same kind of treatment with east pakistan and they had a bad result but they had not learned their lesson and they're making the same the, mistakes with baluchistan as well the pakistani politicians like bhutto was also brought up under the you know wings of ayub khan so they had seen only this kind of military dictatorship this kind of forced democracy or you know controlled democracy to be there mm -hmm. they had not seen a full fledged democracy where in anyone can say anything about anyone and get away with it mm -hmm. that kind of a free democracy they had not seen secondly the west pakistani psych had been built from 1947 and it continues till date of a very conspiratorial kind of a society wherein all sorts of conspiracy conspiracy theories come up every day every day there is a new conspiracy theory us has done this pakistan has done this bhutto has done this all sorts of conspiracy theories keep floating around mm -hmm. whenever a democracy in a country is weak conspiracy theories are there in abundance okay. conspiracy theories in abundance means that democracy is weak there and that democracy has always been weak in west pakistan in pakistan now okay okay bhutto was not able to control uh, to take control of things he then tika khan was appointed in 72 i think he continued till 76 and thereafter 76 he gave he chose zia ul haq as the chief of army staff so just a question here so the bombing of baluchistan where 10000 people lost their lives that was also done under under tika khan as the military person as the military yes, chief yes, yes so not yes. so not only was he the butcher of Beng bengal but he also did the same thing in baluchistan no this is not talked of but yes to, <laughs> but if, it was at a lower case. scale because there was such a big yeah. scale over there but yeah. similar tactics it's like if yes, when yes. when you have a hammer everything looks like a nail right it's that yeah. saying okay yeah they actually did not know how to handle things uh, they did not handle things well i would put it that way okay now zia ul haq was i think uh, seventh or so in the seniority list when oh. bhutto picked him up he picked him up from there he thought that zia ul haq would be a more pliable zia ul haq was seen as a pliable as a yes man kind of a person mm -hmm. and zia was picked up for that reason he superseded seven generals in fact wow. he was the eighth in line he was he, also a very religious person and that's where i think the the whole concept of normalizing jihad within, zia, the, within the pakistani uh zia, military. Is, uh, zia is an iran okay and uh, he his origin iran they are a uh, farming community you know which uh, like uh, iran is akin to mali's sort of you know that kind of community okay they are an agricultural community okay. which is slightly lower in order that is what people talk of iran community okay in their and in their from, yeah, cultural in their setup, social hierarchy cultural setup, that's how of things yeah okay. he is from and he was from jalandhar his uh, origin is uh, from jalandhar he was a muhajir to say to to that extent so jalandhar india so he jalandhar yes yes migrated. okay and zia ul haq had religious leanings from the from his own way of working but zia ul haq was a shrewd politician and shrewd uh, general too he he was a very shrewd person zia ul haq uh, gave uh, like ayub khan 
Ziaul Haq was the before this i'll just tell you that uh, wherever where, wherever the state has given extensions to their chiefs those chiefs have created ruckus and problems in the state hmm. ayub khan uh, got in this tenure extended and then he extended his tenure himself similar was the case with yaya khan and now ziaul haq ziaul haq tenure he his tenure was extended then he extended his tenure he continued to be chief of staff till the time he was killed in an air crash uh, suspiciously so people say that he was bombed or whatever uh, there's a bomb planted in his aircraft mm -hmm. so all sorts of theories were there he zeyavla continued in as chief of army staff and the president after bhutto from 76 to 88 he was the chief of army staff till 1988 so it was during zia is that that's when the soviet union they invade afghanistan yeah and 70, then 76 he took over as chief of army staff but then the 77 78 the turmoil in west pakistan continued to grow against the the political turmoil in west pakistan continued to grow grow against bhutto bhutto wanted to quell this turmoil militarily but ziaul haq was not able to was not ready to you know continue with him in that manner and gradually zia realized that uh, similar to you khan that if he has to do all these dirty jobs then he might as well sit in the chair and do it yeah why so someone he, else uh, why general. someone else yeah he got rid of Bhutto, put him in the cellar and finally he you know got him hanged on charges on after a trial, after a court trial, of course. He was hanged in 1979. Now, Ziaulak uh, is uh, like uh, Ayub Khan gave Bhutto to Pakistan. Ziaulak gave Nawaz Sharif to Pakistan. Okay. Okay. He <laughs> yeah. was the person. Okay. He was the person who brought in Nawaz Sharif. Mm -hmm. Nawaz Sharif was picked up by him as a, he was a non entity and he was promoted. And he was the one, he was then uh, made Chief Minister of Punjab, then he became Prime Minister, etc., etc. And uh, the gift of Nawaz Sharif to Pakistan is by Zia Udak. Okay. Similarly, and... he created Muslim Islam, Jamaatul Islam. Okay. okay. What, what, is, what was so special about Nawaz Sharif that uh, Zia was like, he's the Nawaz guy? Sharif, that... Nawaz Sharif was a blind person as far as Zia was concerned. He was okay. a he was, he did not have any you know much of political world and all that and nawaz sharif he thought that he could you know do his bidding okay during his time but nawaz sharif rose to become a man of his own uh, stature of his own you know a man by a separate man by himself and gradually the uh, nawaz sharif was able to come into his own being okay and uh, he has also done a lot of damage i'm talking about those people who have damaged pakistan those mm -hmm. gifts who have damaged to pakistan the next person who was gifted by ziaulak to pakistan was fazlur rahman juip head he was also pakistan's gift uh, ziaulak's gift the other gift sorry just let me finish yeah then zia gave the gift of terrorism yeah. Gave the gift of ISI strengthening, gave the gift of sectarianism to Pakistan. Sectarian fights within Pakistan started at a very high level during Zia Ulaq's time, and they are continuing after that. Zia created all sorts of sectarian outfits to fight against each other to ensure that he continued to stay in power. And terrorism, obviously, after 1979, USSR entry into Afghanistan. Yeah. The USA came in being came came in and terrorism was also a gift by Zia Udak. Zia worked with the USA very closely. Yeah. So yeah, just so speaking of the gift of terrorism, that that would be uh him sort of uh inculcating jihad into the culture of the Pakistani military. Yeah. right because prior to this the concept of, of of jihad was not that much prevalent within the pakistani military that's that, that's a gift of zia would that be a fair statement yeah ayub khan was basically not a religious person ayub mm -hmm. khan ensured yaya khan also they ensured that the pakistan army 
you know, was sort of not a jihadi outfit. It was a Muslim. It was a Islamic Muslim outfit, but not a religiously, you know, on not religiously jihadi kind of an outfit. It was mm. sort of it fought on professional secular lines. Okay, that is what it was. But Ziaulak ensured that the uh, jihadi, you know, sentiment started creeping in into Pakistan army. Ziaulak is also responsible to gift the menace of drugs to Pakistan. Wow. The drug menace also was Ziaulak's gift to Pakistan. So he has gifted a lot of things to Pakistan for which Pakistan is paying till date. I wanted to hone in on the campaign in Afghanistan and uh, the Pakistan military's role in that uh, versus the US mil military role. and. Uh, so and you know obviously led led by Zia for the Pakistani military. How would you assess his role within within the uh, within the Afghanistan campaign? Because that is one of those campaigns that turned out to be successful, successfully conducted by the Pakistani with the help of the Americans. But they were able to uh, achieve their objectives in this particular scenario. In 1973, the oil you know boom had started after 1973. OPEC had come into force. The Saudi oil was, uh, uh, Saudis were making good money after 1973. So there was a lot of money available suddenly after 1973 to the Muslim countries of the Middle East with mm -hmm. oil, you know, prices rising up and uh, the oil becoming, uh, you know, gold for them. One factor was this. And uh, the Saudis started finding Islamic, uh, you know, extremism of their own kind into the so into Pakistan as well as through Pakistan to Afghanistan. So Saudi involvement in fanning religious extremism and jihadi extremism in Pakistan and in Afghanistan is also very uh, is also was also there to a great, great extent in Zia Ulak's tenure. Zia allowed all these things to take place. Zia allowed USA to CIA to build their bases there. Zia allowed the, you know, a lot of refugees came from Afghanistan who, from whom various, you know, people were picked up to fight the, uh, you know, uh, Afghan government there, to fight the UA, uh, Soviet Union forces there in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And these people were armed with the good uh, state of the art, not latest state of the art technology, but modern uh, tech weapons yeah uh, anti aircraft missiles were stinger given, missiles the stinger well known missiles. stinger missiles yeah yeah and uh, these people were trained by cia, CIA and lot of military lot of militant outfits ter terror outfits were created operated from northwest frontier province of pakistan and north balochistan northwest north balochistan from there they operated and this is how terrorism then gradually initially the focus of terrorism were towards afghanistan but then gradually they spread into pakistan as well mm -hmm. yeah okay. because now it has become a part of the it has become normalized yeah. and a lot more people are following that and it takes time for that culture to change now with the victory and with, with the victory of the american side along with the pakistan side within afghanistan and the defeat of the soviet union over there who would you who would you say played a bigger role? Was it Zia and his and his uh, elements within Pakistan doing all those activities, supporting the Mujahideen within Afghanistan, or would you say it was Zia just let everything happen and the U.S. Uh, assets and resources come in and they basically ran the show and Zia just gave them the land and the uh, fighters to actually do the fighting. Which of this scenario would you say is more close so to the truth? Pakistan Pakistan got a lot of money during this period. So there was progress. There, were, there was visible progress within Pakistan. So people were happy that, yes, money is coming in initially. A lot of dollars came into Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Now, Zia's role is there. He allowed you know, free-flowing anti-terrorism, anti-Soviet Union activities to take place through Pakistan into Afghanistan. And uh, to that extent, the victory, the credit goes to Pakistan and US and Zia 
also. But USA gave the latest weapons, USA, the CIA trained these people, all sorts of things. They, they created new outfits of Afghans. Mm -hmm. So it was basically Afghans killing Afghans and Afghans killing Soviet soldiers. That is how it was. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, I was watching this movie. It's called uh, Charlie Wilson's War. It's it basically goes into you know the uh, the CIA operations within Afghanistan against the Soviet Union and the, you know all the things that they did. So they have actually uh, Om Puri who was playing Zia in that movie. <laughs> it was funny. Mm -hmm. uh, they they pretty much minimized the Pakistani military's role and Zia's role within you know obviously it's an American movie and they said they it is, tell it from their perspective obviously. More of it was American role okay. yeah, but then because they were providing the basis so therefore pakistan had a role to play in it if pakistan had not provided the basis the facilities and the you know all other paraphernalia the americans would not have been you know that successful yeah so all, all they provided was their assets and their area and the yeah. the show was run by the by the americans so yeah. zia was could, it, can, it, can, cannot be said that oh he was the great military thinker that came in and created the situation that led to the defeat of Soviet Union. Mm, yeah, you can say some to some extent, but not to a great extent. Yes. Okay. So it was sort of in the middle. Got it. Yeah. So, so Zia gave these drugs and all. Now Pakistan Army had by now got into started getting into becoming an uh, an economic power by itself. The Pakistan army had created a Fauji Foundation, all sorts yeah. of other. Yeah, I've I've heard a lot about the Fauji Foundation that they have their own companies, own own corporations that they make yes. salt, they make yes. sugar, all kinds. They make when everything. Did, when did this start? Like this is they such a weird during, thing that is. They raised. started. They started mainly during this period. Okay, this is also mainly during this, mainly during this yep. period, okay. and uh, they look. Because the drug money came into this drug money, a lot of drug money came, and all these drug smuggling, etc., from Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a, a yeah. major producer of opium, opium and other yeah. drugs. So all these drugs were, you know, taken out from Afghanistan through Pakistan only. There was no other way to take out uh, these drugs. And the Pakistan army controlled the borders, controlled all the bases, controlled all the mil militant organization, all the terrorist organizations. So therefore, the Pakistan army was involved in this drug, drug smuggling. Mm -hmm. So gradually, the drug smuggling cut came to the Pakistan army to a great extent. And uh, this money which came in was utilized by Pakistan army to take control of the state properly, to establish its own institutions, its own uh, Pakistan army has got its own private transport setup, mm -hmm. its own transportation network, its own uh, sugar mills, its own, you know, manufacturing units of various kinds and uh, it is an independent uh, economic conglomerate by itself it's it's a country within a country basically that is why that is why it is so powerful and the yeah. generals benefit most from it the surprising part is that the benefits from all this all these you know Fauji foundation etc etc and all the you know largest that uh, the government gives to the military men it is basically it uh, the generals 99 percent of it is given to the generals some brigadiers up to brigadiers something some you know minor things do come up do are given but uh, below brigadier rank uh, the officers they get them they survive on their normal salary and they retire or whatever if they are not able to get promotions yeah they are they are they are given a little bit of land also it, obviously it's yeah. more land than you know what an indian army officer would uh, more benefits than an indian army officer but it's definitely yeah. way less than what the generals yeah. do so yeah so the talk. generals get their uh, then the um, army people started getting posted to civil establishments as uh, you know like the DCs and all, they started working in the civil establishment also gradually. So army penetrated into every organ of the society. And this is where the ISI started actually getting its strength. It is the ISI which was controlling this drug smuggling, etc. So ISI got all this money. The ISI was able to 
launch major operations with this money which that was available to that was available to them at hand and so, isi actually the strength that uh, isi got from the power that isi got during the alox time was much more than it, what it was what it had earlier isi became the all powerful organ of the pakistan army yeah. what what seems interesting over here is that prior to this period uh, the Pakistani military, obviously, they, they had the military component to it. They had political interference within the political matters of the country. But with this, they also have economic interference that began during, during this period of Zia. And so the, the, a, a new angle has started, it seems like. Yeah, they not economic interference. I would say that their own uh, separate independent uh, economy, an independent economy. Yeah. Had taken shape. Yeah, my my point on that is that yes, this this economy that has been taken by the Fauji Foundation would have yes. been done by the private enterprise. Yes, yes, and would have create would have been a part more of the private end. Yes, private enterprise, more jobs, more money in the private sector, but it was not there, and it all remained within the. Uh, <clears throat> it was all pocketed by the few journals who were controlling the affairs. Right, and then then, then there's no free market over there because if no. this is controlled by the by the Fauji found, it's not like any other sugar company can be created that can compete no. with the Fauji. That's no. not not going to happen. So they they interfered with the economics of that country yeah. by letting go of free market capitalism within the country as well. Yeah, and they had a total control over over the you know budgetary allocations also the army was given budgetary allocations much higher than what they would have got otherwise mm -hmm. so all these factors were there and under zia like actually the armed forces and the isi became very powerful organs of the society mm -hmm. so now, now 1980 can, um, sorry, 1988 just, yes. sorry yes Yes, I was about to get to that only like 1988 so prior to this zia is is a good soldier for the Western Bloc. He's he's worked with them very closely, uh, and then this accident happens. This is the second time that a Pakistani general of of high high caliber lost his life in an aircraft with the in downing of an aircraft. 1988. He's a, he had gone on a visit to Bahawalpur military station, mm -hmm. and he took off from there. The Next in line was Mirza Mirza Afzal Mirza, Mirza Aslam Bey. Okay. He was the chief of Mistah. By that time, he had been appointed as chief of Mistah. Or oh, sorry, he was the next in line. He was not appointed as chief of Mistah. Zia Ullah remained chief of Mistah till the time he died. Yeah. His plane took off. Zia asked uh, Mirza Aslam Bey to also come in the same flight. But Mirza Aslam Bey said, "No, his aircraft is waiting. He will go in his own aircraft." And uh, he said bye bye to uh, Zia Ullah. And he kept standing there. This is what the great mind says. I one doesn't know, you know. Yes, yeah. this is for sure that he refused to get into the. He did not get into the plane which uh, Zia Ullak was uh, flying in, flying in. But the U.S. ambassador in Pakistan was also part of the same plane, and he also died along with that, along with the crash. Mm -hmm. U.S. ambassador was also part of that. There was. They say that there was a bouquet of flowers which uh, which held that which uh, in which there was a bomb or something. It's, it's mm -hmm. all grapevine. Some say that there was a missile which was struck. Some but that's all conspiracy theories. Conspiracy. Pakistan is full of conspiracy theories. <laughs> there, yeah. is, there is nobody there, knows. There is a lot of there, there's, there's a lot of material people. also, right? Yeah. <laughs> For yeah. They state. keep they uh, they keep you know thinking ki, uh, this what must have happened this must have happened so conspiracy theories are abound in, in abundance in Pakistan on all mm -hmm. in all fields that's a fact. Okay. Mirza As Aslam Beg then uh, as soon as the crash took place Mirza Aslam Beg came to the general GHQ and he then became the chief of army staff. He mm -hmm. was chief of army staff for three years eighty eight to ninety one. Mm -hmm. Then Asif Nawaz Janjwa. From 91 to 93. Asif Nawaz Janjwa was uh, poisoned, so to say. He died in while he was the army chief after about two years of tenure. Now, they said this, that he was uh, given cyanide. And what, was now, is that an, an established is, fact or is this guy, one of those, uh, an, another one? It is, it is closer, to, closer to established fact. 
okay because uh, they say that his body had cyanide sample some cyanide mm -hmm. uh, you know samples were found in his body after the after he was these these Pakistani died. generals keep on dropping left and right what's going on so why was Janjua also was Janjua actually it's a, you know it seems like he, he was a he was a very he, not, uh, he was not part of the setup he was a professional he not, soldier he he did not uh, by this time I think Nawaz Sharif had come into power mm -hmm. and uh, Nawaz uh, one has got a habit of having his own ways he does not like anyone to say no to him he mm -hmm. he's intolerant of that there was there must have been some tussle and uh, people say that he was poisoned at the people also suspect the role of Nawaz Sharif in this after Asir Nawaz Janjua was uh, he died then Abdul Wahid Kakar took uh, took over for next I, three years I just had a question before we move on to the uh, so I mean in do, during this time nothing major happened except for no. one fact sorry I just want to make, make one point here so when the Afghanistan campaign ended and a lot of those uh non military but the, the, those jihadi elements that were who were fighting within Afghanistan were diverted towards Kashmir and the Kashmir problem starts is is that or is the story something different Zia, Kashmir problem started in Zia Lux time hmm. even the Sikh problem the Punjab secessionism also started during Zia Lux time Zia Lux, yeah yeah Zia Lux actually you know started uh, creating these uh, terrorist organizations to fight in Afghanistan as well as in India okay. and he also started finding anti-India sentiment in the among the Sikhs so mm -hmm. this uh, Zia Luck has got a major role to play in all these activities so you had like multiple projects on ongoing yes. parallelly okay yes yes all right so now we went from Janjua to Kakkar Janjua to Kakkar, Kakkar to Jahangir Karamat yeah. okay, normal tenors Jahangir Karamat was also a professional soldier so was Kakkar all these people they did their jobs for three year tenors and they faded away very comfortably so it seems like 90s yeah 90s sort of early 90s was the time when they had some this amount the of they, military yeah. stability because the Ziaul Lux tenor had created a lot of shindi in Pakistan they army was finding it problematic to uh, problematic to take control to control the situation within the country they were realizing that terrorism was finding inside the country in the country also mm -hmm. sectarian elements were fighting with each other there were all sorts of you know lashkars which uh, the sunni lashkars would attack shia masjids and all that those were sectarian you know fights had already started mm -hmm. within pakistan this was zia Luck's gift again to pakistan Okay. Now, after Zangir Karamat, Musharraf, Musharraf took over. Musharraf yeah. was also picked up by Nawaz Sharif, and uh, he was uh, he also superseded a few generals when he took over. Okay, so Parvez Musharraf. Now, um, did you want to continue because now we we will be going into uh, 1999 Kargil and then the Parliament attack and then in the, in the last 20 years or uh, whatever has happened. Um, do you want to continue this uh, at a later stage, or do you want to continue this now? I would I suggest. I would suggest we go on to. We can continue later. You can continue today also. You can continue anytime. I would suggest that you, like you know, Musharraf tenure. Then after Musharraf, there was not much, and thereafter we get on to the present. That is the Bajwa tenure. Right. There are there are four major. Uh, uh, no, four or five major uh, areas where major military dictatorships Ayub Khan, then Yaya Khan, then Zia Luck, then Musharraf, who became the president, and then Bajwa, who tried to become the president. Mm -hmm. These are the you know major areas of concern that uh, have caused a lot of chaos in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. We can continue later, no problems. Okay, all right, so at this time, we'll uh, call it a day. Uh, in our next episode, what we'll be going through is we'll be going through uh, the 1984 Siachen peace where India took Siachen and then 1999 where Pakistan followed the same strategy but in Kargil 
and what happened before that and how uh, what was Musharraf's role in that. And then post post Kargil, the coup that happened in Pakistan, and then uh, Pervez Musharraf becomes president, and then from we'll go from there. Um, right. So okay. thank you. Thank you so much for taking out the time. This was a this Thanks was a, a fascinating conversation. Thanks we we went into so many thank directions. You. Yeah. And it was it was fun. I I hope you also in, uh, enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, it's very enjoyable. Thank right. you. So All right. So we will uh, catch everyone later. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.